Welcome back, Ronin Renegades. I am Lupine Fiasco, this is Daily Fi Gameplay, and today we are going to talk about the 2023 Flesh and Blood World Championship and what it means for us. For anyone new to the channel, and especially those looking into Fi for the first time, welcome to the Resistance. In case you haven't already heard, Alex Agriu took Fi Rising Rebellion from Zero to Hero and is now your 2023 World Champion. He covered a path through a tough field of competition, culminating with wins in the top eight against Yuki Lee Benders and Shing Sang's Icelander and Aaron Chance's Dromai. It's been over a year since Fi has found success on a large stage, but when it rains, it pours. How can we use the momentum generated by Alex's incredible performance to fuel our own success? It starts with his deck list. I won't call this a deck tech per se, I can't speak to Alex's card choices, especially the ones that differ from mine, but what I will say is, since our lists are remarkably similar, I can at least point you to my deck techs. Both my Switchblade deck tech and post Lexi update video can be found in the description of this video down below. While you're down there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. It is the best free way to support me and to make sure you see daily Fi gameplay in your video feed five days a week. Of the 80 cards in each of our deck, 73 are identical. I'll point you to my own content to justify the inclusion of those 73 cards in the list, because what I really want to talk about are the seven cards that are different. I play Soaring Strike and Lava Vein Loyalty for the consistency that they bring. Soaring Strike works to ensure that I can activate Phi during my turn. Lava Vein Loyalty is a link on the chain, discounts the Phi activation cost, and is never a dead draw from an Art of War. Spell Fray Gloves is tech against Kano and prevents 5 points of damage on his combo turn for the low, low opportunity cost of a single sideboard slot. Speaking to Alex's list, where I opt for consistency and safety, he makes riskier and ultimately more rewarding card choices. Bittering Thorns plays better than Soaring Strike on smaller hands. A blue and Bittering Thorns represents a potential 7 points of damage compared to Soaring Strike's 6. It also scales better with more cards in your hand when your ability to discount Phi isn't an issue. Soaring Strike's Draconic Typeline is often relevant, and the ability to give your finishers go again may save your Snapdragon Scalers on a big turn, but the extra point of damage generated by Bittering Thorn's hit effect will likely translate better into wins. In the same sense, Ancestral Empowerment is, at its best, free damage. In a standard Phi hand, it represents an extra point of damage at any point in the chain, the best use case of this, of course, is to trigger Mask of Momentum. If you attack with three Ronin Renegades and your opponent blocks the third attack with a three block, Ancestral Empowerment gets you one point of damage over that block and one extra card. At its worst though, Ancestral Empowerment is just dead. It can't target certain meaningful cards like Ravenous Rabble, Lava Burst, or Phoenix Flame. It also pitches for one. And on your most awkward Art of War turns, where what you really needed to draw was an attack action, Ancestral Empowerment may take that lack of legal targets and leave you with a loss. The same can be said for Lava Vein Loyalty, which doesn't have natural go again and doesn't present a breakpoint for Mask of Momentum triggers. To summarize, where I've been teaching you in my videos to opt for safety, Alex took a riskier list and truly excelled with it and I suggest we all try the same thing. Oh, and of course, to briefly touch on Erase Face versus Spell Fray Gloves, this is an instance where Alex took the safe alternative to my fringe line. Dash.io is the hot new deck, and OG Dash's representation in the top eight shows that she has not gone anywhere. Erase Face as a one-of to shut down boost and Dash.io's effect is a meta call and ultimately a very good one. In the current meta, you are almost certainly going to see more Mechanologists than Kanos, and having a way to tech against them rather than our Wayward Wizard should generate more success. 
with the success of Alex pushing us forward, what can we expect as far as resistance going into the rest of the Bright Lights meta? With Phi propelled solidly into the top tier of heroes in the Bright Lights meta, surely we need to be afraid of anti-Phi tech. Well, the good news on that front is there really isn't much that other decks can do to target us specifically. We should certainly expect the old workhorses of the Uprising meta to make a reappearance. This rounds on me and that all you got are both excellent counters to a harmonized Kadachi strategy, but are much weaker against Searing Emberblade. As post-Worlds lists solidify and it becomes clear which heroes will find space for these cards in their lists, and more importantly in their matchups versus us, we can adapt our strategy to fight them with Emberblade and Mask of the Pouncing Lynx. The race face made a brief showing in the Dynasty meta during Dash's brief stint as a tier 2 deck, and is finding its way back into many lists now as a counter to Mechanologist. Some enterprising fab players may decide to run it against us as well. Results of the strategy will be mixed, just like they were back in Dynasty. There are turns where losing our Draconic type line is devastating and results in a much weaker turn, where there are also turns where it is completely meaningless. As a side note, if a race face finds a strong foothold in the meta, that is an extra point for running Bittering Thorns instead of Soaring Strike. There is certainly tech that prominent meta decks can play against us, but none of it is all that good. Bravo can run Crush the Weak just like he has previously, but Crush the Weak is stopped by a 2 block from hand and equipment or even a single sink below. Withering Shot from Azalea or Riptide produces on-rate damage, but is mostly negated by boarding in Emberblade against Ranger. There are other prominent cards in the meta that do actively hurt Phi, but they are already seeing play, and opting to run more Frostbite or Frailty Generation would hurt Wizard or Ranger decks more than it would help them. As Phi, we are in a great position where we won't have to worry about that many cards that we aren't already familiar with, and we can mostly mitigate the damage with proper sideboarding. Phi is sitting in a great position heading into the remainder of the Bright Lights meta. While there aren't too many competitive events happening up until the release of Heavy Hitters, we can look forward to taking down Armories, any remaining Battle Hardens or Callings we make it out to, and walking away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. That said, Here's a reminder to you and to me, recent changes to the Living Legend system say that a hero who achieves LL in the middle of a pro quest or road to national season will be ineligible for play during the remainder of that season. With Phi picking up 300 points as the world championship winning hero, he now sits at 724 Living Legends points and is in second place on the LL leaderboard. When we aren't spending our off-season practicing with ancestral empowerment or scouring the internet for affordable copies of Red Bittering Thorns, now is a great time to practice with our backup heroes. I truly hope you've enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, please do me a favor and head jab that like button. I'll be back tomorrow with more Daily Fi gameplay, and once again, congratulations to Alex Agriu for their amazing run in Barcelona and their new status as the flesh and blood world champion. Until tomorrow, take care.